Hi, welcome to ICA Online Service. We are so glad that you choose to worship God with us today from wherever you are. But before we begin, here are some important announcements that you might want to know. ICA Prayer Service on Zoom happens every Tuesday at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. You can check our Instagram on Tuesday to get the meeting ID. Join the prayer service for this is how we grow our faith in the Lord. Parents, ICA Kids Department prepare church material available for your kids. You can download it at bit.ly slash ICA Kids online. Pandemic cannot stop our kids' relationship with God. Follow ICA Kids on Instagram to get the latest updates from ICA Kids. Friends, here is another way for you to donate online to the ministry at ICA. As easy as just scan this QR code on the screen or visit icsby.com giving for more information. What bothers you bothers God. Let's bring it before Him through prayer. ICA Pastor will be praying for you. Just write down your request on the link shown in the screen or go to bit.ly slash ICA prayer online. We will pray together with you. Remember to follow ICA on social media, on Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, if you haven't. Our team uploaded important information, playlists, devotion, and more interesting content and updates for you. Physical distancing is not spiritual distancing. Next week is Communion Sunday. We invite all of you to participate. So prepare your communion items at home, any bread or crackers, and fruit juices. Let's honor God and do communion together from wherever you are. All right, those are the informations for today. And I pray that the presence of God will go beyond every screen. Now let's worship God together. If I'm not there and 
you're not done, Lord. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done. Testimony from death to life Cause Chris rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony Oh I'm alive This is my testimony From death to life Cause Chris rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm testified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
eyes to see my King in majesty your grace compels my soul to love and draw in close I lift my hands and sing and surrender everything in you I know My God, to you I'm called. Now until forever, Jesus, I surrender. Show me what I don't know more of you. I'm desperate for your presence, longing to be with you. Lead me to a new place, more of I won't submit to any fear Where I'll go, you've been before, yes, Lord All my trust is in you, Lord Yo 
Lord God, we want to thank you this morning uh, for your presence in our lives and for coming down and being with us as we, in all of our homes, uh, although we may be separated physically, we are not separated spiritually. And being able to worship uh, together and to be able to seek you together, God, we thank you for this gift. And I just pray, Lord, right now as we begin to dive into your word, that your spirit would reach out to every home and everyone who's listening today and that your presence and your blessing uh, would be on their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to ICA's online service. I'm Pastor JV and I'm excited that you can join us uh, today. Today we're going to pick up with the life of this man Abram in Genesis chapter 17. And if you uh, have been following along with us, you know where we are. If not, feel free to go back and listen to some of our previous sermons. But at this point, Abram has been on this journey with God. And God has called him out of the land that he lived and God has given him a promise both of a land that God is going to give him and of many descendants. And at this point, uh, none of those things have taken place yet in Abram's life. But he is still following God and believing in faith for the things that God has said. Now, this particular chapter in Abram's life is going to be one that has a lot of significance because in it, God is going to do two things. He is going to give a promise, and that promise is going to be something that is going to change the lives of everyone, myself, you, everyone on earth up to this day. The single promise to Abraham at this moment is going to be life-changing for every human being that is going to follow. Not only is he going to give this promise, but he's also going to give an example of judgment. And so there are two things that are going to happen in the life of Abram that are prophetic and that foretell a future event. One is the promise and redemption and salvation that God offers. But the other is the danger of the judgment at the end of the days when the wicked will be judged. So let's begin. Genesis 17, chapter 1, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, now remember, God has been promising him he's going to have a son for a long time, and now he is 99, and so this promise does not look like it's going to happen. It says, The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Nations. So the first thing that God does at this point is he's going to give Abram a new name that reflects the promise that God is giving him. So his old name meant Abram, which meant exalted father. But now he calls him Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. Because God is promising him that Abram will be the father of many, many nations. In fact, he gives a promise, a similar promise, and a similar name change to Abram's wife, Sarai. In Genesis 17, 15, and 16, it says, God also said to Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. So Sarai, uh, we think, likely means kind of um, striving or even contentious. Uh, but Sarah comes from this root word sar, which meant a prince or a nobleman. So Sarah would be princess. And this name also correlates with the promise that God is giving to her because he calls her something royal because kings are going to come from her. Now, this uh, is a promise that both 
Abram and Sarah laugh about uh, because Sarah's like 90 years old and Abram is 99. And so in, in the natural world, this just doesn't seem like something that can happen. And so God encourages them to still trust in him. And at this point, uh, Abram laughs. Um, later on, Sarah's going to laugh. And so the son that God is promising, he says, you will name Isaac because it means he laughs. So it's God who's going to have the last laugh in this family's life. Now, this renaming of Abram and Sarah is an interesting thing because we see this happen a lot in Scripture where God will come into a person's life and give them a new name that reflects the destiny and the purpose and the plan that God has for that individual. Even though that person hasn't lived up to it yet, God will begin to give them a name that shows what God is going to do with them. Abraham, every time he heard his name, would remember that promise from God. Sarah, every time she heard her new name, would remember that promise from God. We see in the New Testament that Jesus gave names to his disciples as well. He called Simon, he renamed Peter, which meant a rock, something that was solid. In fact, in Scripture, when we get baptized, the Bible says we're baptized into the name of God. And this is adoption language. It basically means that God is putting his name on us, that we are getting a new name, and it's his family name, that he is now identifying us as a part of his family. And in Revelation, we see this carried forward as well. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it known only to the one who receives it. In Revelation 3.12, it says, The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never will they leave it, and I will write on them the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven, and I will also write on them my new name. So we see that God has a new name for you and for me. In Scripture, it's talking about two things, a name that He will give you, but also His own name that He's putting on you. And this is important to remember when the world begins to name you. Sometimes in this world, we can be labeled, uh, we can be given uh, names and accusations and uh, slander that comes our way, you know, especially in our modern day um, where, you know, our online exposure makes us uh, more susceptible to the voices of so many more people than we would have before. Uh, online bullying happens. Uh, cancel culture can happen. And sometimes the world can come at us and try to stick a label on us and tell us that we're something that we aren't. But remember that God has a name for you. It is his own name that he puts on you, and he is giving you a name that is his destiny for you, and it is a name of victory. And so he's done this here with Abram. So in Genesis 17, 19, it says, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And at this point, God is going to ask Abram to do something as a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham. Now in the past we've seen that God has already made a promised covenant to Abraham that he would create many descendants for him, but now he is going to make a requirement of Abraham to be a part of this covenant between Abraham and God. And we read about this in Genesis 17 verse 10. It says, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Okay, so this is the sign of the covenant that God makes between Abram and all of his descendants afterwards. Now, why? Why circumcision? I do want to pause for a second and just point out that um, when pastors here at ICA are developing a preaching series and you're not the pastor who's in the room deciding who gets to preach what, you end up being the guy who gets stuck with the most awkward sermon, which is circumcision, of course. So uh, that's what happens. I'm the guy that gets circumcision. And so here we are, uh, but we're going to dive in and do our best. So 
why would God choose this as the sign of the covenant between him and Abram? I mean, it just seems very uncomfortable. It seems a bit strange. Um, but God has a purpose in everything that he does. And so with this covenant, the promise is going to be about Abraham's son, Isaac, who is a miraculous child. You know, God has waited for this child to be born in such a way that nobody but God uh, could accomplish this birth. And therefore, the covenant that he's giving Abram is marked forever uh, on the part of his body that is involved with having children. And so, from then on, the descendants of Abram, you know, they would have this reminder about a child who was born miraculously. And there is a future uh, prophetic symbol that this is pointing to because in the future, through Isaac's descendants would come another miraculous son. The son through whom God would accomplish the forgiveness of the world, and that is his own son, Jesus Christ, who would be born miraculously of a virgin. And so, all the way back here in the life of Abram, we are seeing a sign that is pointing ahead to this miraculous birth that God says, through Abraham's descendant, all nations will be blessed. The other thing about this particular covenant is that it is a covenant in blood, just as Jesus Christ will have to shed his own blood in order to bring about the covenant between us and God for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, it says that it was to be done on the eighth day. And this is also interesting because uh, the eighth day of a week, you know, the Jewish week started on a Sunday. And so the seventh day would be a Saturday, and the eighth day would then be a Sunday again. And a Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead to fulfill this covenant for us, between us and God. That he died a bloody death, but then he rose again in order to bring about this forgiveness. And so, and this covenant is something that would be personal and private and seen between God and the person who was circumcised. And so it's not something that could really be seen outward. And this is also something about our covenant between us and God, that it is a matter of the heart. It is God who knows the purity of our heart or the secret of our heart and whether or not we have, as scripture says, circumcised our hearts to him, whether we have cut off from ourselves sin and wickedness and the passions that come with our physical bodies in order to be able to pursue Christ. And so that is why, although it seems like a strange way to do a covenant, it actually has a lot of meaning. So I do want to point out that it is not just Abraham who has faith here, uh, but it is all the men of his household. His son Ishmael at this stage would have been a young teen. And you can imagine if your 100-year-old father comes up to you, uh, you know, with the kitchen knife and says, Hey, the Lord told me to do something. And, you know, he's got this uh, flint knife there. Uh, you also have to be a real man of faith to go up because I'm not sure that Abraham's hands were that steady at 100 years old. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure that I'd be first in line. How's that? But uh, so the rest of them were also you know, great men of faith. It's also interesting that it is happening just before Isaac is going to be born. That God has now sanctified, if you will, the body of Abraham and the, the very parts of his body involved in having this miraculous child are now dedicated to God. So as we continue in Genesis 18, we move now to a story where the Lord shows up again to the house of Abraham. And he's going to give him a promise that a year from this point, this birth will finally take place. Up to this point, Abraham has never had an actual solid date. Now God is going to give him a date, but something else is going to take place. So in Genesis 18.1, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And so Abraham sees these men and he asks them to stay. And he goes and he's hospitable, so he decides to put some lunch on for them, which is actually way more complicated uh, for Abraham than it would be for us, you know. Uh, if I was making somebody a sandwich, I'd just go to the fridge and grab some meat and some bread. But Abraham actually has to go get a lamb and kill it and do all this stuff. So, these, so the Lord and these two angels wait. 
And then they sit and they eat together. And this is an interesting thing, the idea of God sitting there in physical form and talking to Abraham. And um, this is one of those things in Scripture that is a bit of a, um, a mystery because on one hand, Scripture says that no one has ever seen God, that God dwells in unapproachable light. And yet we have many occasions where the Scripture talks about God appearing in a form that can be seen by people. So how do both of those take place? And the way theologians look at this is that this, whenever it shows God in the Old Testament in a physical form, in a form that can be related to by people, this is a what we call a pre-incarnate uh, representation of Christ. This is Jesus showing himself in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord or the very representation of God. He is that by which God makes himself known to us. He, uh, it is encapsulated in a physical form so that we can relate to that which is unrelatable. And so when you see uh, the angel of the Lord or people seeing the Lord, what you're seeing in the Old Testament is Christ before he has come in human flesh. And so Abraham shows hospitality towards God. God repeats this promise. He says, this time next in a year, I'm going to come back. Sarah's going to have a child. Sarah laughs. God says, why are you laughing? Uh, I'm going to do this. And your kid is going to be named. He laughs just because everybody's laughing at me. Uh, but you're going to see I'm going to have the last laugh. And so then in Genesis 18, 16, it says, when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. Now, Sodom was a city that would have been down in a valley nearby um, Abram. He, it would have been a place where he could see from the Oaks of Mamre up on the mountainside where he was. And it says they looked down towards Sodom and Abram walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Verse 20, then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and they went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. God begins to speak about these cities that dwell down in the plain. Sodom and Gomorrah were the two main cities. There were several others, however, that were in this valley. And we read first about this valley in Genesis 14 and, and or sorry, 13 and 14. If you'll remember, um, Abram had a nephew named Lot. And, you know, when they decided to part ways because their herds were getting too big, there was competition. Uh, Lot looked down into this valley and he chose to go there because it was well watered, it was rich. We read this in Genesis 13.10. It says, Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the Bible says that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were well known for their wickedness. So we first saw them in Genesis 13 where it says the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel speaks about Sodom and talks about what their sin was like. It says in Ezekiel 16:49, it says, This was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, that means the cities that surrounded her, were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. So this is a, a group of people that are wealthy, they're rich, they have every need, and yet they have no concern or care for other people. And because of their ease of life, they began to become arrogant. And with that arrogance, uh, they began to head down a direction of increasing wickedness. Uh, in that same verse, it says, They did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty, which is another word for arrogant, and did detestable things before me. This is what the Lord uh, says. And there are stories outside of the Bible about Sodom and Gomorrah that to try to talk about what they were involved with. One of them, um, and we don't know if these actually happened or not, but they were part of Jewish uh, legend and tradition. One of them was of a servant of Abraham who went into Sodom and a man struck him on the head with a rock. 
and he was bleeding. And then the man demanded money for the service of bloodletting and then took Abram's servant to court in order to get money from him for the uh, service of him bludgeoning him with a rock. So this, these are some of the stories that come out about a, a city that is just unjust. Uh, and it was also known for its sexual sin and its sexual immorality. This is also the city that Lot has chosen to go to. Um, because of the wealth that was there and because of the business opportunities that were there, Lot has chosen to move his family there. And I, I think we can pause for a second and just um, use this as a warning for us. Um, you know, as you go forward and you see the fate of Lot and the things that happen in his life as well, the things that he loses, um, you know, that we could gain some wisdom about where we as individuals choose to put our family and raise our family. You know, sometimes there may be some business opportunities for you that look really great, but it means moving your kids into a school that you know is going to be a bad influence on them. Maybe it means moving to a city or a neighborhood that you know is going to be a bad influence on them. And that seems to be what Lot did. You know, he kind of chose his business opportunities over the well-being of his own kids and his own family. Um, instead of saying, I'm going to raise my kids in a place uh, that I know that they're going to be brought up in a good way and in good neighborhoods. And so this is something we can learn from the life of Lot is that, uh, you know, it may be very tantalizing. Uh, there may be a lot of money involved in us living in certain places, but um, uh, if it's detrimental to your kids, make a different choice. So in Genesis 19, in verse 1, the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. And when he saw them, he got up to meet them, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. Verse 2, it says, My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go your own way early in the morning. No, they answered, uh, we will spend the night in the square. There would always be a public square in a city and many people who are travelers um, would just basically camp in the public square before they would move on for the next day. And so these angels who Lot doesn't know are angels, he thinks they're just men, uh, say, no, no, we'll just stay in the public square. Now, Lot knows what kind of city he's living in and that this is not a good idea, that this is not a safe place. You know, he's like, this is Los Angeles in the 1980s. Uh, you do not uh, want to be sleeping in the public square. So he says to them, he in verse 3, he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and they entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. So we need to let this sink in here, is that men have come into this city, and this city is so wicked that every male in the city has now gathered around this house so that they can rape these uh, visitors. Uh, this is the depth of depravity that has happened to Sodom. And I want to point something out here that it's not just the men. It says the men, young and old. Uh, you, we get the impression here that there's fathers bringing their sons out. You know, hey, there's some visitors here. We're going to go attack and rape these men, and I'm going to bring my son with me because I'm going to teach him how to do this kind of wickedness. You know, one of the signs that a society ha has truly gone into depravity is when they lose that sense of protecting the innocence of children. Most societies like to protect the innocence of our kids. You know, we don't want our kids watching certain TV shows. You know, even people who aren't Christians have a different standard for what they're going to allow their kids to do and to see than they even have for themselves. Uh, because there is something in us that is innately protective of our kids. Uh, and when a society gets to a point where it begins to corrupt its children, then you know that that society ha has gone so deep into the dredges of sin that there may be no recovery for it. And I bring this up because we're beginning to see this even among our own societies now. You know, I've seen things on TV of people that are um, having, uh, you know, drag queen men who are dressed up as women 
uh, who do, do these drag shows that are now going to libraries and schools will bring children to have the drag queen read stories to them or to dance for them, you know? Uh, there was a lot of praise for a young uh, boy who would dress up as girls and do these provocative dances that was in the media not that long ago. And so what we're starting to see now, even people who are deciding that they're not going to to, you know, when their child is born, if it's a boy, they won't say it's a boy, they won't say it's a girl because they're going to just wait and let the child decide for itself uh, what it is. So they're pushing uh, transgenderism and, and sexual confusion upon their own children. We're starting to see this rise up within our own society. And if you look at it and you say, well, that seems crazy, uh, then you're looked at as though you're bigoted and uh, that, y that you are just uh, not progressive enough. And so, um, but this is a real warning for us because once a society begins to participate in the corruption of its own children, their heart has drifted so far from God that we wonder whether there is a chance for recovery. Now, I want to back up for a little bit because remember, Abraham is with the Lord at this point. He's not gone down with these angels. Uh, he doesn't know what's happening, but he does know that this is a wicked city. And he is beginning to pray and intercede for this city towards God. If you remember in the past stories, Abram actually uh, delivered this city when it was captured by invading armies, when he rescued his nephew. So he's already done good for this city. And now as he stands there before God, he enters into this discussion with God where he says, Lord, I know it's a bad city but surely there are some good people in it. Will you destroy a city even if there are some good people? What if there's 50 good people in it? And so the Lord shows his mercy towards the wicked by he's simply saying, if there are even 50 good people, I will deliver the whole city for their sake. And so then Abram continues to pray. He says, well, what if 10 are missing? What if there's only 40? And then he keeps going, what if there's 30? What if there's only 20? And he finally gets down to 10. He says, what if there's just 10 righteous people? And God says, for the sake of 10 righteous people, I will deliver this entire city and I will not destroy it. And so there's two things that we see here. One is the power of there being righteous people. God maybe believed that if there were even 10 righteous people, A, that he wouldn't judge the righteous with the wicked, but B, maybe there was hope for the the city to change if there were even a handful of people in there. Remember, with 12 disciples did Jesus launch the greatest movement that the world has ever seen. And so maybe the Lord said, if there's even 10 there, maybe we can change this city. One of the things we also see here is the heart of Abraham as an example for us. Is it, it is very easy when we see wickedness and sin to say, God, when are you going to judge these people? When are you going to pour out wrath and anger on them? You know, in the Bible, uh, the two brothers, John and James, they did this. They, 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 there's a city that didn't uh, receive Jesus. And they says, Lord, should we call down fire on this city? And the Lord rebuked them. Why? Because it is not the desire of God. Scripture says God takes no pleasure in the judgment of the wicked, but he would far rather that the wicked repent, that they turn around and they become the person that God intended for them when they, He originally created them. And so if we are going to walk in a way that is pleasing to God like Abraham did, we should be intercessors. We should be those that are praying for our city. That we're crying out, God, have mercy on this city. Will you reach this city? Will you help the people here to come to know you and to know your love and know your goodness and know your forgiveness? When we see people who are in sin, we should pray, God, will you lead them out of that sin to be what you've created them to be? The same way we would pray that for ourselves. All right, so this is the heart of Abraham. He is praying and interceding and hoping for the best for this city. Meanwhile, down in the city, these men have surrounded the house of Lot. And Lot goes out and he entreats them, please don't harm the men that have come in under my protection. In the, in the ancient Near East, there was the thing called the law of the guest. 
and it meant when a guest came into your house, you as the host had to do absolutely anything to protect their safety. And so Lot begins to be like, you know, whatever to my, my family you would do, but don't harm these men who have come in. He's trying to, you know, make these, the, the men of Sodom feel some shame. And instead, they look at him and say, you came here as a foreigner, and now you try to sit as a judge over us? We're going to do worse to you and to your family than we would have done to these men. And so now they try to attack Lot. Well, the angels see this. They grab Lot, they pull him into the house, and they strike the men with blindness. And at this point, the angels reveal themselves to Lot. In Genesis 19, 12, it says, The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city that belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and he spoke to his sons-in-law. So he had two daughters, and uh, they had two fiancés. And so he went to these men, it says, um, who were pledged to be married to his daughters. And he said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. You know, what happens to Lot here often happens to us is that when you begin to speak about the things of God or when you're going into a, a, a place that is full of wickedness, And you begin to talk about God and and warnings of, hey, you should turn from these things and, um, you know, and and fear the judgment of God. Often mockery is what follows. And this is exactly what happened to Lot. Uh, He was laughed at. Um, And the scripture says that this will happen in the last days, that mockers will come with their mocking and say, hey, when is going to be uh, this return that you speak of? And when is this going to happen? Everything has just kept going on for all these years and they will mock the things of God. Scripture says that just as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be at the final day before the day of the Lord. So Lot is unable to convince uh, the men who are pledged to be married to his daughters. And so he's hesitating. And so the angels in mercy to Lot and his family grab them and drag them out of the city and just tell them to flee. And in Genesis 19, it says, verse 17, as soon as they had brought them out, one of the angels said, flee for your lives. Do not look back and do not stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. So Lot and his family uh, flee and they get to a place called Zoar. In verse 23 it says, By the time Lot had reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also all the vegetation of the land. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. The end of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain will forever be a sign and a demonstration of the last final day of God when God judges the wickedness of the world when those that have not responded to him that have lived in evil will eventually be cast into the lake of fire what the Bible calls hell Sodom literally becomes a hell it says that sulfur rained down from the sky I mean mostly we think that this probably means that there was some sort of a meteoric burst over this valley um, In fact, if you go there today, you can find balls of pure sulfur that are embedded all over into the earth uh, throughout that area. You can, they're so pure, you can light them and they will just burn um, without anything else being added to them. 
Uh, there are layers of ash um, all over throughout this place. And what we see there today is the Dead Sea. And I want to talk about this a little bit because at the time that Sodom was overthrown, there were pits there that had tar in them. And so as this fire came down from heaven and impacted the earth, it would have caused all of that to burn. And so the entire valley would have been this furnace, very much like the picture of hell or the lake of fire uh, that the scripture talks about. In the New Testament, there's a valley called Gehenna, which is the Greek word that we, they use for hell. And it was also a valley where all of the garbage uh, was burned outside of the city. And so Jesus used it as an illustration of the final judgment when the wicked will be cast into this place of torment and burning. Well, here in the Old Testament and throughout all ages, Sodom and Gomorrah became also a valley that represented that, a place of fire and judgment and torment. But there's something else that happens here is that eventually this place will be covered by the Dead Sea. And this is also interesting because to the ancient Israelites, the sea um, was also a, an image or a symbol of the underworld or the place of the dead. They would call it the abyss. And so their word for the, um, the, the underworld would be Sheol, and it was the place that the dead went um, until they waited the day of judgment. And so they likened that with the darkness of the depths of the sea, you know, where there's no light. And so this symbolism of the sea is quite powerful. In Exodus, when Moses leaves Egypt, it is a parting of the sea. And that would have been very symbolic to the uh, Israelites about death itself being parted to make way for them. But here, throughout the ages, not only do we have that this valley was turned into a place of fire and waste where nothing grows. It went from being lush like Eden to a burned wasteland. But eventually it will be covered with a sea, and not just any sea, but the Dead Sea. This is the lowest place on earth, and it fills in with water from the Jordan Valley. And over the centuries, um, all of the minerals from that water have been deposited into this valley and it has become a sea that is about 35 percent salt and absolutely nothing lives in it. Uh, it it doesn't support fish it can't support life it is an absolute dead wasteland and so god has set this up as a symbol of the final judgment the place of the dead the place where um, where there is no life whatsoever and where the judgment of God is going to take place. Sodom and Gomorrah became that. And so as we're going to wrap up here with this chapter in the life of Abraham, I want us to see that this is about two fates. In this story, God foretells two destinies. One of these destinies is the promise that he gives to Abraham, that through Abraham would come a son. And through the line of that son would come the deliverer. That through Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the world would bless themselves. And so here we see the promise that God gives of Jesus Christ, who would come through the line of Abraham, who would come through the line of Isaac, and he would be the one who would be the deliverer who brings about forgiveness and mercy from God by paying for our sins with his own life. And so just as God gave Abraham a new name, he says to us, come, come and receive a new name from me. Come and receive forgiveness from me. Come and receive redemption from me. Jesus Christ has paid the price for both you and I, our sins, our wrongs, uh, our failures have been paid by him upon the cross. And he invites us now into mercy, forgiveness, and hope. But this story also shows another fate. And it is the fate of those that reject the offer of God. It is the fate of those that persist in wickedness and in evil, who set their hearts upon exalting themselves as gods, so that they decide that they are the determiners of right and wrong in their own life and begin to set their minds at doing things that God says should not be done. 
And the Bible says eventually a day will come when every human being will stand before God. And we will either stand covered by the mercy and forgiveness that comes through Christ, or we will stand on our own without that covering and be held accountable for our wickedness. So it is a warning against the coming judgment of God, but it is also an invitation into the mercies of God. So as I'm closing, I just want to say this. I don't know where you are today on that front. You know, maybe you're somebody who um, has never walked with God, you don't believe in God, you don't know anything about Him, but as you're listening to this, you know, you realize that life is short, and at some point all of us will launch into eternity, and eternity will be long. And it makes sense to think about and decide, where am I going? after this life? Where will I spend most of my existence? Because it won't be prior to death. You know, we may live 80 years here, and then after that, it is eternity. Where will we be spending it? And so if God is tugging at your heart, I want you to know that He's calling you, and no matter what it is that you've done in your life or mistakes that you've made, God does not take pleasure in the judgment of the wicked. God desires for all of us instead to turn from our sins and to receive pardon and mercy and forgiveness and a new name from Him. And so if that's you, I want to invite you, lift up your voice to the Lord. All it takes is a simple prayer to say, God, I want to know you and I would love to respond to you. Forgive my sins. Help me as I turn away from those things that you say are wrong to be able to have a relationship with you. God is calling and let's respond to him and receive his mercy while there is still time. And let's pray as I let you go. Father, um, I wanna thank you, God, for the life of Abraham. God, um, first of all, for the lessons that we can learn from him. And it's not all successes in his life, Lord, because nobody's perfect. Sometimes there are failures and sometimes there are successes. And we learn from both of those things out of the life of Abraham. But what we see in him is a man who strives to be faithful and strives to follow and obey you. And we see that as he does that, God, that you have a destiny and a purpose for him. And that as you lead him, even when he doesn't know where you're taking him, God, you are faithful to bring about your purposes in his life. Just as today, Lord, you are faithful to bring about your purposes in our lives. And as you gave him a new name, Lord, you give us a new name. And so we give thanks to you for your grace and your redemption. Lord, today I want to pray for your blessing to be on everyone who is listening. Uh, just that your favor would be in all of our families, that you would keep them healthy, you would keep them strong, and you would just bless them, Lord, um, in their homes and throughout this week. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, next week, we're going to be diving in further into the life of this man, Abraham, so don't miss out. God bless. Thank you. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought Deliverance in the exodus of my heart Cause you found me, you freed me Held back the waters from my release Oh yeah with me. You're the God who fights for me. Lord, I
And how 